as we look at Good Friday and we look at what has happened on this day, it will be good for us as we live our life. I'm way down the line in years and I'm trying to learn to develop a way just to be quiet of heart and mind and think about this day. Think about what 12 and 3 meant today and those were the times where Jesus moved closer to death on the cross. And hopefully as we live our lives together in years to come, Good Friday will be that, that you're able to wake up and in a way think about this day in a very um, thankful, sincere way of life. And I want you to be able to turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy was a young pastor and the Apostle Paul, and he's going to give his short biography here in just a second, but Paul tries to help this pastor named Timothy. He writes two letters to Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy that we have in our Bible. And 1 Timothy comes right after all the books that end with the I-A-N-S, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 and 2 uh, Thessalonians. Keep, on, keep right on coming until you come to the book of 1 Timothy. And that is a pastoral letter that is written. Uh, Paul wants Timothy to hear from his, Paul's own heart. He wants him to hear how much he relies upon the grace of God himself. Timothy is in Ephesus. He's trying to help this church that's fragmented and, and needs a lot of help. And Paul is just trying to encourage and give this young pastor named Timothy. Timothy came to faith as a young man. Paul was like a, a spiritual father to him. And now that Timothy is a pastor, Paul is just trying to help him and mentor him. And he writes these two letters, First and Second Timothy. And both of them have a great deal to say to us as living Christians in the 21st century. But I just want to focus on First Timothy, and I want to look at the first chapter. And I want us to start reading in verse 12 of the first chapter. Welcome, everybody at home. It's good to have you as well, and I hope that this day has been good for you, and we're glad that you're with us, and we want you to be able to read along. The words will be on the screen. So let's pick up this, what Timothy begins, what Paul begins, sorry, what Paul begins to tell Timothy, and he says this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Paul always lived with a sense in which he couldn't get over the fact that God would use his life. And I'm going to talk more about that on Sunday morning. Uh, my message is going to be entitled, Grave Living. That's oftentimes we live in the grave. And Jesus wants us to come out of the grave. And just like Paul, Paul had to understand that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, he was who he was and that God could use his life. And he never gave over this fact of knowing that God would consider him trustworthy enough now in his life to enable him to be an example of and to share the truth of who Jesus was and is. And look what he says in verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, that says a lot, Aren't you thankful that the Bible isn't wiped clean? That it only has choir boy stories in it? Aren't you thankful that there's somebody like Paul who says, let me tell you who I really was. I was violent. I was a religious person, but I was violent. I roped up, ranged up Christians and killed them and imprisoned them. I was a violent man. But look what it says. I was shown mercy. Every one of us should say amen to that right now. And I'm not saying you have to, but in our hearts, we should all say, oh, Lord, thank you for your mercy in my life. Because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now here we get to really the heart of what I want to get to tonight. This, this really starts getting good. 
He says in verse 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Now, some of us would say, well, I guess, I guess Paul really needed a lot of grace, didn't he? Because he was a violent man. If you're there, I want you to consider changing your there, there, and saying, that's my story. Don't just look at Paul and say he needs God's grace. I hope every one of us says, that's my story. Hopefully at the end of our lives, hopefully not even at the end of our lives, we'll be able to say to somebody, God has been good to me, far beyond what I deserve. The grace of the Lord Jesus has been poured out on me. This is such a day that we should think about such greatness of God's goodness and grace to our lives. Here in verse 15, Paul begins to help us to see three important things to remember, particularly on Good Friday. First is this. It's good to remember on Good Friday who we are. That's the first one. Look what he says after, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Look what he says. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of who I am the worst. Now, don't be doing this. No. You need to turn that around and say, this sinner needs the grace of God. Amen to that? It's a lifetime habit and discipline but to develop humility in our life to understand I have no reason to look at anybody else. I need the grace of God. I'm desperate for it. That's you and me. And that's a good thing to remember on Good Friday. The second thing is this, not only who we are, but what Jesus did. Verse 16 I am the worst of sinners, but he says, for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. We need to remember tonight, church, that I don't care how low, how far, how deep you think you are, God's grace goes deeper still. And it goes further still. And it goes higher still. That as long as we come to him, he's such a patient God. He's patient. He doesn't give up. And when we come to him, we receive eternal life and that life is eternal. That's what Jesus does for us. And when you stand inside the fold of knowing Jesus, his commitment to you is forever. Not only for this life, but for all of life, all of life to come. Third, not only who we are and what Jesus did, but our life's purpose. Such is a good thing to remember on this day when the one who did need to give his life was willing to give his life for you and me because he realized that was his life's purpose. I mean, he would have liked to have let this cup, as he says, or this plan go. If there's any other way, he would have surely done it, but he knew, he knew that if he was willing to take upon him, all the anger and sin and violence and wickedness of this world, that it would free us. He realized that was his purpose for coming. You know what our purpose is? Look at verse 17. Now to the good teacher, now to the moral example, now to the nice guy. 
you should never say that on Good Friday and neither on Easter. Jesus is the king. He will not give that up. And since he's the king and Lord, that helps us to understand we are where we are and what our life is all about. And Paul says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only true God, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen to that? That's something we should remember on Good Friday. One of our own writers of American literature, Mark Twain, said this, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And can I tell you this tonight? Your purpose for being wide is that your life from this day forward may be an example that your motivation and your concern is that you would bring honor and glory to the true king. Don't let a king or queen of this world take that away from you. You and I need to be able to say, oh, Jesus, may my life in some tangible way, and we're never going to be fully able to do this, but in a very strong way, now that we know the why of our life, may we be able to say and pray and desire, Jesus, I want my life to bring glory and honor to you. I think that can be done. I think Jesus will help us through his grace and power to live a God-honoring life. I think we all have to grow, and I think we all mature. But I've seen enough people who have said, "That's that's my burning desire of my life, and their lives showed it. There's a dude right now in our church who's going through some things, Ken Schubert. The bib-wearing saint of God. I've seen him in the, in the hospital, and I hated to tell him that he wasn't going to be able to go home, but I walked into his room in Centennial. This has been two or three months ago, and he's sitting there fully dressed. You know what he's in? His bib overalls, longing to go home. There's not a scent of arrogance or pride or guile in that man. He knows he can't hear too well, but he takes everybody sincerely and lovingly. He's experienced a lot of tragedy and sorrow in his life. But almost without fail, He didn't this past time, so I can't say he always does it, but almost without fail. You know what he tells me? God has been so good to me. I know it can be done. I know we can live lives that point in the direction of Jesus, the true king. I know we can do it. And on Good Friday... It's a good day to say, let that be the course of my life. Amen? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. That's how our life can be. I hope that as we live our life, you and I are beginning to understand not only when we were born, but why we were born. And if Jesus can change the life of a hardened, violent man, the worst of sinners, to have as his purpose of his life to show Jesus and to be an example of Jesus in this world, I know it's possible for us. And Lord, we just want to tell you on this Good Friday night, thank you. Thank you. We can't even begin to understand what crucifixion did to you. You were not only brutally 
executed, but you were mocked and made fun of. That's what evil and sin and anger and violence does. But we are so thankful that through your love, you overcame death in the grave. And it was for us. May in some small but significant way, may we live our lives so that you receive the glory and honor from all that we are, all that we say, and all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said amen.